Okay, continuing in our um, series will be Yasha Khan with a multi-state cannabis testing data analysis. Thank you, everyone. So as Mike said, multi-state cannabis testing data analysis. First, who I am and why I'm doing this. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been in cannabis testing across four different markets, four different states. And I have been responsible for data in one way or another for most of this time. But especially the last year and a half, when the needs of uh, cannabis testing uh, were to understand what is happening in the industry within cannabis testing. Why, why does data look the way it does? And I think a lot of labs, every, every lab in the industry, most growers in the industry have seen that there's some sort of um, strange things happening with testing data across the country and in most states. So through a bunch of Freedom of Information Act requests, we gathered data sets from multiple states. Um, and there was one state that already had open data, data available. Uh, we put the data together, and together it's across five states, 80 labs, over a number of years, and has almost 600,000 flower samples. So it's a whole lot of data, and there's a lot within this data set. All of the data is now openly available to everyone since it has been made publicly available through FOIA. And all of the analysis that I'm going to share with you is done in something called Jupyter Notebook, which has all the code, the analysis, the summaries, the narration, all in one place, so that if you disagree with this analysis, then uh, you can take the code yourself, use different um, assumptions, and do with it as you please. So once we get the data, uh, different states have different regulations, so we need to normalize the data across different states. And the first step is to clean the data. Sometimes there's a flower with over 3,000% THC written in the data set, so we get rid of those. Then we normalize across the different regulations, and we pick the formula THC plus 87% of THCA, which is max THC, and we moisture adjust it. Some states prohibit moisture adjustment, some um, mandate it. Uh, some states force uh, total THC, which is THC plus, plus THCA, others have max THC, but we wanted to make sure that we can compare all labs and all results across the country. Once we did that, uh, we have this huge data set. And before we can answer and look at a lot of the questions that all of us are curious about, terpenes, cannabinoids, et cetera, we need to understand the integrity of the data. Can all of the data be trusted, or are there aspects of it that should not be? Uh, some early takeaways. There's some truths that we're going to see today, and everyone with the data can confirm. The shape of THC data, when reported as a histogram, shows a normal distribution. It's a bell curve. And there's some really cool, interesting anomalies. And there's a true average, as in, if you take out the extreme outliers that are relatively easy to identify, most labs have pretty much the same average potency. So first, what is normal distribution? If you take the height of all of the fully grown birch trees in the world, or, or uh, adult men in the US, shoe sizes or newborn baby weights, you're going to see something that looks like this. It's a bell curve with uh, most of the results being somewhere in the middle, and then fewer as you go away from the center. We see this in almost all of the cannabis testing labs across the country. Um, I can keep clicking, but I'm going to show just a couple examples of this is what we see every year for almost every lab in every state. And then the question is, what is not normal? Again, men's height. The average male in the US, fully grown male, is five foot nine. Few guys are over six foot five, and few are under five foot two. But sometimes there's data manipulation. And here's an example of self reported men's heights. The data set is more than enough to, which should show a normal distribution, but we see two things here. 
The clearest one that comes to mind is men that are 5'11 may say, no, no, I'm six foot tall. And another one is that everything is moved over by one inch to the right. A pretty recent study but from a couple of years ago, I don't think anything has changed since, 49% um, of women use height as a filter on dating websites. So we know that there's an incentive uh, for men to sometimes exaggerate their height. In cannabis, there are also incentives, and we know what they are. Their association of amount of THC uh, to price. Uh, flowers under 20% typically don't sell, and the more THC there is in a product, uh, the higher it can be sold for, and the faster it can sell. Knowing that, let's take a look at some histograms of labs that are aware of this uh, pricing scheme. This lab, I assume, has a motto internally, do not report anything under 20%. If you can get it to 25%, please do. But this is only one lab in one state. Another lab in another state, this one has a histogram middle finger. It has, do not report anything under 20%. If you can get it to 25, please do. If you can get it to 30, that would be ideal. And another lab in another state has exactly the same theme. Uh, if products are under 20%, they don't sell. And growers tell labs, we will leave you if you don't do this. Subjectively, I think, I see that there's a discontinuity in all of these, that there's something happening at 20%. And you might see the same, but good thing is we don't have to just you know, squint and try to see it. There are data forensics tools that are used in courts, they're used in the financial uh, fraud cases, they have been used in academic papers for cannabis, and they are applied to data sets that should have a normal distribution, and applied to them where you see the point of discontinuity, uh, they answer the question, could this have occurred through randomness or is it more likely that there is data manipulation? And they all result in, yes, there is a need to take a closer look because this looks like data manipulation. Such labs are found in every state. And with these labs, with, with the samples that they get, they don't necessarily inflate the potency of every sample they take the samples that do not fit the narrative of need to be over 20% and they manipulate, they seem to manipulate those. The way that they can do this, from most expensive to least expensive approach. Most expensive is you test the product and you get a result that doesn't fit what's needed. You test it again and test it again and again and again. That takes way too long, it's too expensive in terms of materials and time. Uh, easier, um, is to manipulate the second test. You know that it's at 14 instead of 20. Uh, write down the incorrect weight, knowing that you need to manipulate by a certain percentage. Or use the you know, pipette incorrectly. Even less expensive is manipulate the result of the first test. Uh, you, can, you, know, you see it's at 18%, uh, write 21.1. And this, labs have been caught doing this, labs have been fined for doing this, and the least expensive, and labs have also been caught for doing this, is dry lab. What's the point of even testing if you're gonna fake the numbers? Might as well just write the numbers that are being requested. So that was discontinuities. Those kinds of discontinuities are rare. They appear in every state, but they are really rare within the data set. Um, but what happens with labs that have normal looking distributions but are inflating potency? How can we see this? How do they compare to um, other labs? So for the most part, labs can really be divided into three groups. Those that I just showed with major discontinuities, those that have an average max THC of around 19.5 uh, to 21%, and those that have over 24%, as in, uh, on, this, on this slide, what we see is two kinds. Uh, here they are grouped together. The one on top is those that have around a 21% max THC, and the one at the bottom is over 24% max THC. When we try to align them, they don't align, and we see that there, it looks like two different data sets. Um, and let's, let's, we, we needed to figure out what are they doing? How can we really calculate what is happening. Is there an actual statistical difference? 
Or could it be that different products are just so, uh, sent to the different labs? Could it be that the labs in red receive the best products and the labs in green receive the worst products? With a data set, set of this side, sorry, with a data set of this size, in most states what we can do is identify growers that have sent the same samples to multiple labs, labs on both sides. We know that it's the same samples because they have the same names and they're sent around the same time. From that, we get two different data sets, one that's the green, one that's the red, and we run something called the student's t-test, which is a statistical tool with which we can ask the question, could these two uh, different, different data sets have been created uh, through randomness, or is there something else that's happening? And we know that the products are the same, so the conclusion is that the, uh, since randomness could not have caused such a difference, um, the conclusion is that the approach to measurement is what's different. To bring it back to the men's heights example, if let's say you're a man that's five foot nine and a clinic pulls up to town and says, hey, test your height with me and tells this man that's five foot nine, I'm going to measure you, you're six foot ten now. I don't think people are going to believe that guy that's saying it. We know it's not true. Uh, I don't want to say which of the labs is, is manipulating data, which one isn't, but both can't be right. And we also know what the incentives are. Labs with systematic inflation are found in every state, and the approach to this kind of manipulation, um, this is both seen in the data, but also in the case documents for the labs that have been closed for this, is systematic manipulation, where they take the same kind of approach for all samples. This can be done by everyone in the lab that is aware of it. An example is when testing flowers. Instead of homogenizing the flower, you get as many trichomes in there as you can into the weigh boat. Or most egregious is you take a sample into a container, you shake it up, whatever falls off is what you test. And you will get significantly higher potency by doing so for every sample and a lone wolf approach in which a single person in the lab knows that this is happening. This can happen by manipulating the instruments or the calculations. So, so far I've spoken about labs, what happens at labs, but what does this kind of data manipulation do to entire markets? These are four states, A through D, and uh, each one of these Plus shows potency, averages, and range uh, for each of the years where we have their data. We see growth and potency every year, and that's expected. And it's expected because growers know that flowers under 20% don't sell, so they're going to stop investing in those. And growers are likely getting better. But what we're really seeing in the data, the, the, the real reason for this kind of growth is that the labs that offer higher potency get more business. And here you can see, as a grower, th these are all the tests performed in Massachusetts uh, by a single grower throughout one year. As they transition from one lab to another, their potency increases by over 25%. It happens overnight as they switch labs. And for the grower, this is excellent. They can, it's much easier to sell 24.8% uh, weed than it is 19.4% weed. And so with the market, the labs that provide higher potency, they get an increased market share. And the ones that don't provide higher potency, they decrease the market share. And there's an endpoint to this. What, what happens when this continues for years? And across every state we're seeing this, but some states are in a worse position than others. Here's a state that only has three labs left. The top left lab I already shared, this one has major discontinuities. The top right also has a pretty major discontinuity. And the bottom one has a um, nice bell curve. Uh, the top two have a 26% average THC, which is around 17% inflated. 
and the bottom one has uh, even higher potency than those with discontinuities. This state does not have a single honest lab left. And for regulators at this point, it's much harder to fix this problem. They can't shut down the labs because then they shut down the market. There are solutions, but th this is a nightmare scenario for regulators. Every state has dishonest labs, and when a single lab shows up and offers to a single grower um, such excellent service or such impossible results, uh, every other grower in the state, in order to compete, needs to make the decision, do we go out of business or do we inflate? And every lab has to do the same thing. Every time that a grower comes to a lab and says, but that other lab is offering me higher potency, or lower failure rates, the lab has to decide, do we um, start to do this, start, start to inflate potency, or do we go out of business? And over the last month, I know of two labs, honest labs, through the data you can see that they're honest, they have gone out of business. I think yesterday I, I read about PSI labs in Michigan. And as you saw, there are states without a single honest lab left. Why is this important? So first, consumer protection violations. I estimate that between one and two billion dollars worth of mislabeled flour is sold per month across the US. And flour is just the first product that's made because from mislabeled products, someone has to make concentrates and from that they make edibles. And if you start with a mislabeled product, um, it's likely that everything's going to be mislabeled after that. If ExxonMobil was watering down their gas by 20%, we would all hear about it, and every attorney's general would speak up, and they would get the animated dollar signs in their eyes because that is a consumer protection violation. Next is research. The US has had more or less legal regulated cannabis for 10 years. A lot of research has been done. But what if all of that research, if it was done on using label claims, for example, uh, clinical research, um, what if all of that research has to be discarded because it's based on bad data? As an example, there are labs that manipulate, that inflate THC that almost never show any other cannabinoids, unlike almost every other lab. So if the data can't be trusted when it comes into a study, then the results of the study should not be trusted either. And most importantly, it's dangerous for consumers, workers, patients. Patients can't dose properly. Consumers can't predict the effect of cannabis products. Let's say you like to smoke a joint every night, and you buy a joint and you really like it. It's labeled as 35%, but it's actually 20. And you smoke it every day. You, you go about and you do your, your activities might make the decision once you're comfortable with that high that you have, you drive and do your errands. But then one day you get um, a joint that's labeled as 35%, but it's actually 35% and accurately labeled. You're gonna be much higher than you predicted you would be. That's dangerous for you, that's dangerous for the you know, family coming back from vacation. And although I don't have enough time and it's not here, the safety screens, the, manip the manipulation that's happening there is at least as, as bad as what I showed, but I think multiple times worse. And anyone interested in taking a look at what safety screen manipulation looks like in Massachusetts, please visit my poster, my table, and I'll show everything that's happening in Massachusetts. But knowing that safety screens are being manipulated, this again t uh, speaks to what, what about the research that's, been, that's happening? What about clinical research that shows that something is not working? Maybe it's because there's pesticides or mold or whatever else. Until this problem is fixed, uh, we're kind of, what's the point of some of the clinical research or label claimed based research? Like what's the point of doing it at all? But um, labs have been closed for doing this. They have been caught. They have been caught through data. They have been caught through off-the-shelf testing programs. There are excellent data tools that can identify what within the lab needs to be looked at and likely 
how to audit it, what to find. Um, and the things that have worked in other states. Open data. Washington State had open data uh, for all of their testing. And a cannabis data scientist named Jim McRae reported about it annoyingly for years until reporters started to notice, start to ask questions of the regulators. And then the regulators closed down a bunch of labs in Washington. In Nevada, a group of data scientists, including Jim McRae, got a hold of their testing data. And um, the same thing happened. Multiple labs got closed for exactly what I have been showing. Soon after that, both of those states took down their open data. Because open data is a window, it, it can show everyone, is the market actually being regulated? Should it be trusted or not? And so I am very much for open data and believe open data is a clear, um, necessary and free first step for every state to deal with this. A second is off the shelf testing. Being able to see what I showed, this is like looking at the forest. It shows generally the, the problem, but I, I can't necessarily say any one product this is manipulated. Off the shelf testing takes products um, test them, ideally at multiple labs, and Jeff Rawson has done this wonderfully at the Institute of Cannabis Science, where it's a demonstration of does the label match the actual product? And if you can match, this is what the market looks like from the data. Here's the specifics of these products that do not match uh, what's on the label. This is what leads regulators to have to take action. Otherwise, they don't. And lastly, it is whenever products are found to be mislabeled, especially when it's systematic, product recalls are necessary. This is for products to then be relabeled correctly and for growers to have to take into account when selecting well lab to use the risk of having product recalls. Um, all of this could not have been possible without the inspiration of folks that did this before me, without the current support of Jamie, Jim, Jeff, Keegan, Ruth, Pavel, and a huge and awesome thank you to everyone at MCR Labs. Thank you. thank you so much, Yasha. Time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will come bring you the mic. Hi, I'm Matthias. I work at GRI Labs and the lab. And um, I love the way your presentation got better as it, it got, I was even more intrigued as it went along. So I might've missed it at the beginning. If most states don't have an open data policy, how was it that you compiled all your data? Thank you. So first, thank you for the feedback. I'll try to be more exciting from the start. <laughs> um, so Jamie Toth did a Freedom of Information Act request in Oregon, from what I understand, and that demonstrated to me that this could be done through Freedom of Information Act requests. So I sent Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act requests to somewhere between one and two dozen states. Um, almost all of them said no right away, and maybe half of those had real legal reasons why not, because in their uh, laws to not share that kind of data. And the other ones, after a little bit of convincing, they shared that data. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, are the numbers that you um, showed, how, how much of the test results are relative to oils produced from the flour, or is it all flour? Uh, so the... I, I said a number at the very beginning that was just under 600,000. That was only flour, and all of the analysis that's here is only for flour. There is data on everything else, but I have to start somewhere. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Uh, so I guess somebody has to ask the big question, uh, the, the new 
CCC memorandum, I believe it is technically. Uh, uh, I don't want to make myself sound stupid and explain it. So how, how will it affect anything? And uh, I don't believe it's a silver bullet, but I'd like to hear from you. And also what other, you know, we're probably going to see more. What else do you expect and what else could be helpful uh, from the CCC directive wise? Yep. I think that note started and ended with something along the lines of this is the first in a series. That was the first time that they re ever that the CCC has ever stated anything with any kind of direction on what is um, to be reported by labs, which is excellent. It's the necessary first step. Um, and I, I'm very much looking forward to what else they're going to say. And it's you know they can't say everything all at once. I'm sure they need to have discussions. They need to meet with the right people. And I hope that this was the, f the first step towards what's needed. However, um, that bulletin was only a suggestion. And if a single lab in the state does not follow it, the suggestion, then, but every other lab does, then that single lab is going to have a 25% higher THC reporting than everyone else. Because you get 13% from the decarboxylation of THC in that formula plus moisture adjustment of around 10%. Uh, so n knowing that at least one other lab will not do this, no lab can do this. And every lab want, or I assume every honest lab wants the CCC to say very directly, this will be enforced and this is law. And this is mandatory on this date. At which point th that this, uh, this action will take the, um, we will get what we need from, from this, this specific wording, and I'm hopeful that it continues, that, that there's more things like this, but also investigations. Uh, you know, we can't just say, okay, okay, starting now, everyone has to be honest. We need to take a look at what about all the other products that are available on shelves today? Should those be relabeled if they're inaccurately labeled? What if we see that there's a lab, and please do visit me at my table, that a couple years ago found, you know, under 2% uh, they had a under, lower than 2% fail rate for mold, while every other state and almost every lab in the country has a 15% fail rate for mold. So, something needs to be done so that th there will always be cheaters, but there needs to be some sort of repercussions to doing so, I believe. There is no state that does not have that well-defined other than Massachusetts out of the states that I've studied. Every state has a formula that's written, mandated. Uh, just some, something really interesting, really, really quick, sorry. Uh, you'll, you'll, I hope you guys find this as cool as I do. Uh, in this state, they have a regulation. It has to be moisture adjusted and the formula is max THC. In this state, you're not allowed to moisture adjust has to be max THC. This one is moisture adjusted THCA. Different formulas in every state and the cannabis that arrives at these labs has read the regulations and knows where to be to meet the 20% mark. So all of them have very set regulations and we can see that in, this, in, in, the, in their data. Plus in the regulations and in speaking to the regulators. Hi, I'm Anthony Goodson, a consumer. I'm wondering, how much does it cost to do a, uh, to find the THC in one sample? Uh, different labs have different prices, but probably somewhere between 40 and 100 bucks. So it's not real, a realistic thing for just your average consumer to go out and, and uh, what kind of testing do, machines do you, would you have to use? Or I imagine there's different types of testing. So, so th there's, uh, if you're just a consumer, then what I believe you should be able to do is trust the labels. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> and there are devices that you can buy, they're around $20,000 a piece that individuals or growers can purchase, where you can do this for yourself, or you can set up a lab. If you want, you can get everything accredited, hire scientists and get it that way, or around 50 bucks to walk into a lab and get it tested, but that's, the, that's more than the price of the product that you're testing. So what we need is a fix to the problem so that you can trust the labels and not have to go 
get it independently verified. But I do know that some scientists that are doing clinical research right now do test their own products knowing about this problem. So they, they have to connect with a lab that they for some reason identify as trustworthy to do this kind of testing. Another one over here. Thank you for this analysis, it's really impressive. Um, you've stressed the big cutoff at 20% for THC. You also mentioned the mold rate being something that you've seen. Are there any other metrics that you've seen a very distinct uh, like discontinuity in and what effects does that have on the consumer market and the success of that lab? Uh, THC is responsible for the price of the product and mold accounts for, um, in, in the, in, other than California, in, those, in the states listed, in all states that have a 10 percent, uh, sorry, in all states that have a 10,000 CFU per gram limit for mold, just like Massachusetts, it accounts for around 95 percent of all fails. So mold does. So mold and potency are the two tests that are the biggest influencer of, of value. Either you have to discard the product or remediate it with the mold result, and with the potency, it determines the price. Everything else, let's say all the heavy metals together account for less than 1% of the failures. Pesticides significantly lo lower than that. So it's harder to catch manipulation at such low numbers. And also the, the risk of doing science that an auditor, bad science that an auditor may catch that doesn't drive you business is also less likely than what we see here. Uh, we do see some, so example in Washington, they don't have total yeast and mold testing, but they do have specific pathogens that are tested for, with which we do see the sharp line for a couple of the labs at the action limit. There's one state for which we have one of the heavy metals that has a beautiful curve, uh, uh, exponential curve, and a nice little uptick right before the action limit, nothing after. So there, there's elements of it, but these are the big drivers of um, markets. All right, one more question. Hi, thank you. Um, do you think there's any opportunity for growers to sort of educate the market in terms of terpenes and all these other factors that go into cannabis products versus just like the unit price to consumers? Is there any opportunity for that in your opinion? Yeah, I think you should. I think you, you, you're better off doing that than sticking to THC. I know in the vape, um, the, the biggest companies that make vapes, uh, they say to make the first sale, uh, THC sells that first sale, but people keep coming back because of the terpenes, because of the quality of the product. So keeping your clients happy with actually good product is a good long-term solution, especially if what's happening here gets louder and those growers that are basing everything on you know, manipulated data, if you can differentiate yourself by not doing so and by focusing on, and we have you know, all the terpenes, we have all these other cannabinoids, the entourage effect, the freshness of the products. Um, I, I think it's, it's the right long game, especially with my biased hope that this becomes loud and this problem goes away. Um, yeah, assuming that the the tests are like, you know, standardized, would it ever be possible to have, um, you know, each product tested by two independent labs, and then that way you can kind of find out the outliers, or that would be a, a situation where, hey, this one's always coming in it way over or whatever? Uh, so there are, again, uh, about Jeff Rossen, who runs the Institute of Cannabis Science. I, I think what, what they are doing is something very similar to that in that they can test products at multiple labs and really answer this question. But to burden growers with the price of additional testing, I think what's, what's the better solution is for regulators to make sure that there is no data manipulation so that th this would not have to happen on a per sample for every sample, but randomly selected samples so that every time that a grower or a lab has manipulated the results of a sample, 
they have a hard time sleeping at night knowing that what if that, that sample gets selected for this kind of random test. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Let's give Yasha one more round of applause. Thank you. For anybody interested in learning more, feel free to go to his poster. We have two more hours left of the Cannabis Science Fair. Hope you all enjoy it. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, in states where this has been solved, it has been done through journalism, more than any anything else. Of course, there are some states that have rolled up their sleeves and changed uh, policies and investigated themselves. But typically, it is through investigative journalism if the state is not doing so themselves. Spread good information. Um, if anyone wants access to this, this data, the results, I'd love to discuss it with them, share it, um, review, make sure that it's loud enough so that the question comes up, why, why is the Attorney General not protecting stoners? Why, <clears throat> why is... Uh, this conversation happening years after the data shows that <clears throat> it started. Um, I, I think it's, it needs to be a loud conversation and staying quiet has not solved this.